Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Innovation Nation today. I'm very excited because I have Jean Simone with us, who is from Brainbox AI. He's the co he's a co-founder and the CTO of the company. So um, Jean, can you please introduce yourself and share a little bit with us around your background, your history, and then we'll get into Brainbox. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sarah, for, for having me uh, at this event. Uh, so yeah, uh, Jean-Simon Venn, uh, one of the founder of uh, Brainbox AI. Um, I would say that I probably work all my life with technology. Um, thanks, to, thanks to my lifespan, the technology is giving us more and more capability as we go. I remember when uh, I was first uh, working with technology in the 80s, um, it was definitely in another world, especially in terms of computing capacity. And, um, and I think what, where I'm, I'm, a, I'm a bit blessed in that career is, um, is uh, if you remember where we were in the 80s and, and the progression that we went through uh, in terms of capacity is now for the first time, um, we're not limited by the technology capacity. Now we're, 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 we're pivoting, right? We're limited by our our capability to brainstorm of what can we do with that technology. And this is the first time in the, really the human man, mankind that we're reaching that point where we're not frustrated by limitation of, we would like to do this and this, but oh yeah, the technology cannot do it. Um, now we're reaching really the point where like our, our limitation is more about the, our capability to, to find the angle and find what we could do with that capability. So it's, a, it's quite an interesting adventure uh, when you look over the, the last uh, 30 years. Um, so right now, I mean, playing with AI, all kind of potential. Um, and then that's what we're really doing on a daily basis. Thank you for that overview. And, and I guess quick question, you know, before we really get into it, how how did you get to where you are like today? Like what, what type of, I guess you could say, like, what was your previous experience that, that led you here? I mean, was there, was there an aha moment you had that made you want to start the company? I mean, I think it would be helpful for the listeners to kind of understand like the why, you know, behind brain box was started as, as we go into kind of explaining, you know, what it does and, and how innovative it is. Yeah, no, no, great question. Absolutely. And, and yes, there was a, I would say it's probably not like a aha moment, but it's probably like a, a slow progression, right? Uh, it's not like in the movies, but um, it, it's really the, it, it started with a frustration. So I was um, from, from the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2010 all the way to 2015, I, I was in charge of a company which was doing uh, energy efficiency around the world in, in large buildings. So office tower, hotel, um, casino, actually, even in Vegas. Um, and you, um, you, you know, you come with your team of engineer, mechanical engineer, electrical engineer, you, you do the retrofit of the building, you, you invest millions of dollars in a retrofit. And, you know, when you're done, the project is, is, is beautiful. I mean, the, the, the building is behaving as it should, it's fine tuned, it's, it's super performant. And then you leave, right? Cause you have to go work on the following project. Um, and, and when you come back a year later to, to check that project, and uh, most of these projects, you have to do these follow-up measure and verification. So you come back and you look at the building and, and it's not the same way that when you left, um, that the slow degradation take, take its toll, you know, month after month. Uh, when you go back two years after, you're really like amazed how much it degraded. And it's, it's definitely need you to require like a full retooling, right? Retuning. And, and, and then it's at that point you say, okay, we cannot just leave like that. We need to keep doing continuous commissioning. Otherwise it, it, it's not the, the performance level degrade. So, so then you look, okay, let's do continuous commissioning. And then you realize that it's very expensive to do continuous commissioning. You have to, you know, have to do these engineer, this control expert. They need to be on, on the ball all the weeks, all the time. These are high paid salaries. So the customer don't want to pay for that. I mean, they, they, they assume that it should be able to just stay as efficient as it was to. Um, and then you, uh, you also realize you, there's just not enough of these engineering control experts to offer continuous commissioning to the entire building stack on the planet. So you're, you're kind of frustrated, right? So we should do it, but we can do it. Uh, um, and uh, I would say what come as close as possible of the aha moment was uh, sitting 
into an autonomous car in California and you're you're just you know amazed by this car which is taking all of the right decision in real time um you're not touching the wheel you're not touching any of the pedals and you're surviving the ride um and you know what it's driving probably very smooth uh, uh, definitely not a sport driving attitude but uh it's it's doing a very good job and it's very complex when you look at each of these like a each of the decisions that need to take place in every every millisecond, if you don't want to die. Um, so you look at it and say, well, wait, wait a sec. If we're if we're the technology is capable of driving an autonomous car without killing anybody, not even the squirrel which is going across the street, um, we should be able to have autonomous HVAC, right? Uh, eating, cooling, and ventilation. That that should be much easier to do, right? So that's what the the kind of the ha ha moment was like. Let's take these type of technology. And let's apply it to the building management space. I love that. And I'm smiling and kind of laughing as, as you say this, because of my background being, you know, five plus years in the, you know, HVAC space, you know, I, I came in, you know, I guess you could say when, as the tech was a little more advanced now, right? Like five years ago, we started really getting our, you know, what together in a sense and like really understanding how, HVAC is truly going to impact the energy efficiency. And, and it's been known for years, right? But to your point, having the right technicians and having the right people who are knowledgeable enough on both sides when it comes to energy and the mechanical piece, really knowing how the controls come into that and play together. I mean, that's an expertise that we don't come across often, at least from my experience. Would you agree or would you disagree? <laughs> oh, I, I fully agree. So back in my previous life, you know, I'm before I kind of realizing what we do, what you just described, um, I said, okay, let's offer continuous commissioning. So I, I went all out, right? So let's, so we create this kind of a NASA type of control center with a big screen and we connect ourselves to all of the building of our customer. And we start to hire these, these person um, that are sitting in that control center. And they're basically doing the live commissioning, commissioning of the buildings. And, and then you, you know, you realize that every time you hire one of these person, you're basically taking that person away from a, from a, from an integrator, from an, a contractor, from a, so you're just displacing, you're creating a problem somewhere else. So then there's a construction company that it's not able to deliver its project because you took away that, that manpower to put into your control center. And you're like, well, oh, this is not good. Right. Um, I'm and, and there's just not enough of them. Um, so it, it's really like a huge roadblock to try to do this at a scale. Uh, and, and it is what it is, right? We're, we're not going to change that. Well, it's very interesting too, because I think what is common in the building technology space, at least from my also, you know, observation is that a lot of what our technicians and our very advanced people know comes from being in the field. And you can't necessarily just like go to school to learn how to create a, you know, little trick of efficiency and, and how to schedule something a little bit better, right? Because also everything often will apply to that specific environment. So you have to understand that specific environment, meaning like the building itself, how it's operating, how it's running. And it's not cookie cutter because every building's different. The use maybe in commercial real estate is common, right? And there's like rules of thumb and best practices that we can create. And, you know, we have um, organizations that help us do that, right? Like, you know, all different types of standards that we can follow and whatnot. But at the end of the day, no one's going to control how much the lights are being used versus how much the air is being used because that's up, that's upon the human in the space. So, you know, it's, I think what's interesting now, it's a good segue into you now, if you can explain, you know, what, what Brainbox AI is, what it really does, you know, what, what's the components that it consists of, and, the, and then we'll go from there. <laughs> yeah, I know, it's an excellent segue. Um, it's, um, so when you look at what these persons are doing, really, and you describe it very well, I mean, they're, they're, they know how things should work, right? But then they look at the building, and then you start to realize that each building is unique. Um, so they're basically taking their knowledge and their reflex and looking at this specific setup, and they basically configure it so it's going to work in that specific setup. 
And then you start to realize like all the buildings are unique. So you, there's no like copy and paste. I mean, if you try to do the copy and paste, rest assured, you're gonna end up with a lot of issues. Um, so it needs to be adapted every time. So, and that's why, you know, the, the copy and paste when, a, a, let's say you take a control sequence or the programmation of how the system should be operating, you start with a copy and paste, but then you make all of the adaptations. So it's going to represent the specific situation of that building. And when you look at the way that the deep learning is working, it basically learn from trial and error, right? So mm -hmm. if you feed it enough data, it will understand how this building works very specifically. And once it's reached that level, it knows what will happen in that building. So that's exactly what we do. We, we connect to the building. And the beauty of it is like all of the commercial building, they already made a huge investment to equip themselves with a control system. And so they have already the data. So we just need to connect ourselves to that existing system. And we basically capture that data, which is already generated by all of the control system. And we then accumulate that data. And when we have enough data, about between one to two months, we have enough data to train a neural network. So these deep learning engine. And what we were looking at is we want that neural network to learn the building and be able to give us a prediction exactly like in the autonomous car. So what the autonomous car is doing as it's moving along the street, it's projecting in the next few minutes what will happen for all of the moving parts. So this car in front of you, this other car, which is going to turn left, and then that, that bicycle, which is waving in the street in a very weird fashion, it's predicting where are they going to be, all of these moving parts, in the next five minutes. And then knowing very precisely where they're going to be, it's deciding where the car should move and how it should move to prevent any collision. So we do exactly the same thing with HVAC is we're basically predicting what will be happening in each of the room of the building. So we know that in 92 minutes, it's going to be a bit too hot in that conference room. And in that open space, it's going to be too cold in 62 minutes. So knowing the future, we then apply an optimization as, okay, now that we know what will be happening and we identify all of the events that we would like to avoid, can we have a preemptive strategy where we could control the system and cancel out these events which are not desirable? And the question is, if we do so, are we gonna spend more energy or less energy? So let's find a combination of control that will cancel out these events and at the same time lower the quantity of energy that I will consume. So it's really moving from a, from a reactive type of control system to a preemptive control system. So we're acting in advance. So we are giving order to the system in advance to basically change the future to a better future. And we are doing that in an horizon of a between three to five hour ahead of us. So there's a lot you just mentioned. I'm tracking, of course, but I, I think it's important that we break a couple things down really quick because what you're talking about is, first of all, I love that you're using the autonomous vehicle example. I think it's super relatable for anyone to understand. And you hit a key point on reacting to what's happening in that given moment, which I think is very important because with AI and with deep learning, when you start taking it to the next step, right? Artificial intelligence, as we, most of us are familiar with, is basically replicating the decision-making process of a human, right? Now, now being able to take it to the next step and predict and react and feel and understand how to adapt with that data to then make a better decision is where you start going into the machine learning, deep learning concept and CVNs. And, you know, we have convoluted neural networks and stuff like that, which is a whole nother ball game, of course. But I think what's really important here is that we talked about, you mentioned earlier how there's like a workforce scenario where when you pull someone from the contractor and then they come to work for you, well, you've just created the gap for the contractor. And it's this like inevitable cycle where um, we're going to miss out whether you're the one taking the contract or losing the contractor. And what's important in that note is that our industry already doesn't have enough people. Like we don't have enough workforce to accomplish the energy goals we need to as a society, as a world. And I think what's interesting here is when you talk about this deep learning concept of reacting 
um, it, it's important for the listeners to understand like what that means when it comes to controls today. Right. And so I'm, I'm, I know I just said a lot of things in one statement, but where I'm going with this statement is I'd love if you could help, help us kind of set, set the baseline in a sense, or, or set the base for the listeners who maybe aren't as familiar with HVAC and controls. Um, and, and what that means today, right. Without brain box, what would, what does the world look like? And then, and then we can transition into what, what brain box is doing to make, make the world ultimately, you know, a better place, right. When it comes to saving our planet efficiency, et cetera, and, and why we're actually using a technology like it. Yeah. Yeah. And then sorry, I probably went too fast into the, the, the deep technical, uh, forgetting no, okay. that, that, yeah. <laughs> no, it's, um, it, but we want to, you know, start with the problem, right? What's the problem, yeah. right? Why? So why, you know, and I, I think it'll help the listeners understand kind of, kind of what the point is here. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's a vast garden, right? So I'm, I'm going to maybe touch maybe two points, which are uh, interesting to make sure. So if we, if we, if we step back basically and, and you go back to the, your living room um, and you have that thermostat in your living room, which is basically when we say reactive, uh, we mean that that thermostat um, has been told that we want 72 in the room and, and will not do anything until the temperature change from a delta from that 72. So let's say there's a there's a, a buffer where the, the thermostat will not do anything in between 73 and 71, um, basically happy. And as the temperature increase in that living room, as it's going to finally reach 73, then the thermostat says, oh, 73, now I have to do something. It's too hot, so I'm going to start the cooling in that living room to bring it back into the area where, which, which I desire. So that's what I mean by reactive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, and it's really not seeing the future. It's basically goes into the real time. And as it hit its limit, it's reacting to it. And then when the temperature go back down, it will stop the cooling and it will just wait for something else to happen. So when we talk about preemptive, um, we say, well, we know that that temperature is going to slowly rise to 73 in half an hour. The question is, can I do a preemptive cooling right now? Uh, that will kill that, that trend that, that is slowly going to 73. And if I do, will I spend less kilowatt hour doing so than if I just let it go to 73? And then there's going to be probably more kilowatt that will be spent to bring it back down to 71 um, uh, or 72, uh, whatever was the desired set point. Um, so that's basically the analysis which is happening in the background. And sometimes we basically come to the conclusion, you know what, we could, even if you do a preemptive action, you might do it to make sure there's no comfort issue, but you're not gonna save any kilowatt. But in a lot of other times, you have in a scenario where that preemptive action is basically saving kilowatt and giving you more, a better comfort because there's no trend going up. So that's what I mean by, that, by, by reactive is a preemptive. Now, the other point I wanna outline regarding the, the shortage of, uh, of expertise in the market is you really have to see this kind of a, as a, an augmented tool. So if you're, if you're a building engineer or a technician, which is basically setting up the system, you could use that AI to augment your capacity. So you let it do the work and you're basically guiding the AI. So, so as, a, as a technician, I could suddenly start to commissioning three or five building in parallel because the AI is running and it's basically I'm up, basically giving guidelines to that AI, but their AI is doing the the day-to-day line-by-line programmation that I, I used to do myself, and I was only able to do one building at a time, right? So now I could do five building in parallel. So suddenly we're giving more capacity to the market. So with the same number of people expert available, they could do a lot more building. And when you look when you look at the building stack right now there's more and more building that need attention than 20 years ago, right? But the number of expert in terms of building engineer and control expert is pretty much the same number than 20 years ago. So we're losing that race, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. And I think it's, it's, it's a really good point because often when the general public or just the average human or pedestrian hears about AI or hears about artificial intelligence, I think often people will jump to the matrix. So they'll jump to this like 
really mystical interpretation of what AI is doing, right? And and there's there, you know, I I was reading an article yesterday about how we're we either are already in or we're starting to begin the net the fourth industrial revolution. Mm-hmm. And it's a very it's it's almost like jolting to an extent if you think about it, because when you hear industrial revolution, you think of history, you think of the past, and you think of like, why did it happen, right? Humans mm-hmm. had to catch up. And that's a huge point because today, if you think about it, if we have the same amount of workforce today as we did 20 years ago, well, how many more buildings do we have today? It's 10 a lot more. A lot more, right? And yeah. how much more are we? you know, occupying the world, this planet, right? And we know global warming is an issue. We know sustainability has been a problem for many years. And so I think it's key for the listeners and just anyone that is learning about brain box, right? Is, is that to understand that this is a tool, this is meant to help. This is meant to make, you know, kind of bridge that gap. And what's interesting, I love about your technology is you guys, not only is it allowing us to be predictive in the field itself, but it's not like brain box is that, you know, new necessarily, right? You guys have had, you guys have had a good footing for a while. And this idea came about in a very, you know, I would say proactive way. Like no one, I don't think was thinking about this 10 years ago necessarily. Right. I mean, you, when I look at a lot of the technologies out there, there aren't that many companies doing what you do in a format where anyone can benefit from it. Often you'll see customized predictive analytics at one building that is literally built for that building, but you can't take okay. that and put it in the next building. Is that fair? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And and also to, you have to take into consideration, I'm actually gonna go back to your question about a lot more building, because yeah. there's an interesting uh, anecdote here that I could tell you that just, just before the, the COVID hit, I was in uh, Toronto and uh, with one of the big building owner and we were looking through the window and um, the, the skyline of Toronto and. And I was, you know, I was looking at all the tea crane and I said, do you have any idea how many tea crane there is right now in Toronto? And, and, the, and the guy said like, well, yeah, we, we know because we, we had a conference last week and they, they've actually told us a number with the city of Toronto. And it was 100 tea crane uh, in wow. Toronto downtown. That was just before the COVID hit. So, um, and can you imagine that? I mean, they're, they're building hundred new tower. Uh, so uh, how many of there is in San Francisco? How many there is in New York? Uh, and uh, we're not even t- counting all of these suburb business with a couple of story high, which are like growing like mushroom, right? So I mean, when we say there's a lot more building, there is a lot more building and it's, it's a fascinating to see. Um, it's t- to, um, and I kind of forgot what was your second question here. Um, I was carried away when my tea crane uh, and I no, it's okay. I, I will say um, there is there is a big question I do want to ask and, and make sure we we discuss and it is around, um, you know, your technology itself. So, so we've we've kind of, I think, scratched the surface and helping helping, you know, us understand, you know, the the why the mission and like what what gaps we're trying to fill. So if if now thinking in an actual building format or um, spaces, right, an actual building, a high rise, whatever it is, could you now kind of explain how Brainbox works, like what components are involved, and then what the ultimate, you know, result outcome looks like? Yeah, absolutely. So we um, uh, we we have to connect to the existing building to get the data. It's it's the fuel to, for everything. So we either have a, this this little edge device which connect to the different uh, systems. So depending if it's a Johnson Control or or Distech or or uh, Honeywell. Um, so that's that's one of the way. The other way is a Tritium Jace uh, driver. So so we have a driver. So that, I think that's much easier than sending a box and plugging a box. But uh, either way, the, the purpose here is to connect to the building, get the data. We, we move that in the cloud. We go through the, the training of the, of the neural networks. So they're becoming super, super predictive. And when we say predictive, um, we like to say that a model could graduate when they reach a precision level of a, of a 99.5% of the next five hours. So then we say, oh, you're good, you could graduate. And at that point, we basically start the modulation. So 
we're trying to basically find if there is a control strategy which would be more efficient. And then when we do, we do that every five minutes. So we read all the information every five minutes. We do that basically optimization analysis, and then we write back. So we literally start to control. So at that point, it's the AI that's operating the control system of the building. Um, and that's usually like a big moment because um, whoever is in charge of uh, doing the operation of that building now suddenly it's kind of easy for the first time he's got a co-pilot eh? uh, and we say we call it like the automatic pilot but he's it's not him operating the building it's now suddenly that ai engine which is operating the building on his behalf mm -hmm. and he's now becoming a, a ai coach so he's not the operator he's becoming the ai coach and he's he's making sure that everything is done properly um so that's how uh, that's how it's basically operating um and the building is it, it's you know, sometime going through new event, a new behavior, and the AI was is detecting new behavior. It could be a tenant which is moving and a new tenant moving in. Um, it could be uh, COVID. COVID was an ex extraordinary event where suddenly tower were like just empty uh, from one day to the next uh, entire tower were completely empty. So what's happening when then is the, the neural network realized there is a change, a big change in behavior, disengage itself, so we go back to the control sequence, which was operating the building before, retrain itself to understand what is the new behavior and then re-engage itself. So it keep learning as the, the things, the situation evolve and it's discovering new behavior. So another example is, is if we deploy during the winter, uh, Canadian winter, I would say, um, of course the AI is very good uh, in, in the winter mode, but as going into spring, it will discover that, wow, the winter does not go forever. There is something else in the winter and it will train itself as it's discovering the first spring days where it's suddenly we need cooling instead of eating. And it's, it's just gonna follow that trend as it's learning new things uh, through its journey. So this is, this, is, this is a really nice explanation and I, and I have a question now. So when it comes to the actual you know, you, you refer to the operator, like the human as the coach now, in a sense, um, is, is the brain box solution or system or program actually then sending a command back to the BMS to make changes and controlling that now? Like it's kind of an overlay. Is that, is that the, a, a fair way to understand it? Exactly. So you still have the existing programmation in the building, which is doing its job in reactive mode. And then you have the AI, which is writing also back to each of the points. So modulating, but it's doing it at a time step, which is different than a, than a reactive control sequence. It's doing it minutes or hours before. So it's, it's wow. writing to the same point, but at different time in the continuum. So if we're not doing it, basically, then the reactive system will do its job. Interesting. Okay. This is very helpful and, and to understand because I have an example now. I have a use case I want to kind of share with you and, and get your feedback on. So let's say hypothetically, we have a really big arena, right? And a, or a large stadium, large, large environment that, you know, obviously there's multiple uses within um, built recently, right? Commission recently, a uh, brand new build. And Today, let's say it was built two years ago, a year ago, whatever it may be. Today with COVID, right? There's no one in the spaces. Let's say this customer, let's say this opportunity or this client is maybe not spending more than they were spending before on energy, but they're still spending the same amount with COVID and with no one in there. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, is that, in a, is that a scenario where the brain box AI you know, solution could, could come in and, can, and help? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and we saw that a lot in the last year, right? Uh, where suddenly like building were, were set and night set back 24 hour a day, seven days of the week. Um, and, and the AI just said, okay, that's the new uh, comfort level. Of course, the AI is not aware there's COVID and it's not aware that there's nobody in the tower anymore, but it understand that now the new, the new comfort required is at that level. And then now it's trying to optimize at that level uh, mm -hmm. instead of whatever it was before. So you still get a percentage of savings, but you, you get it from a new baseline, which is lower uh, from that point of view. Um, and try to go back to your, to your question. I mean, what we usually see is we're, we're able to improve 
uh, you know, these, these events which are a bit too hot, a bit too cold, and people are complaining. So we're able to reduce these events by about 60%. Uh, average, and we're at the same time that we usually reduce the energy spending by 25% of the entire tower, which is, has a big impact on the HVAC side of that pie, which is, which is uh, uh, usually taking in between 50 to 70% of the, the energy spend of the tower or the building. So wow. it's, a, it's really bringing, trying to optimize the comfort, which is an intangible, and also the, the tangible, which is the money you're paying at the end of the month for that energy bill. Wow. Okay. So that's very interesting. And I guess one thing to note, I mean, one of the things and, you know, our, when I was, you know, really more focused on the HVAC side of the house, I, I specialized more on controls. Like I, you know, I understood equipment. It was, I wouldn't say it wasn't interesting to me, but, um, you know, I thought the controls component of it was the coolest. I'm more, you know, I think in a mathematical way and solving problems is something I always found very interesting, of course, probably why I'm an engineer at heart. But, um, you know, what I think is interesting is we would always say, you know, your controls is as good as your equipment, just like the equipment is going to operate as good as your controls. And, you know, one of the things we'd run into a lot was it wasn't that maybe it was commissioned improperly or the programming was done or, or, you know, maybe, maybe there were, you know, misconnections between the controller and, and the equipment. I, I think what was interesting we would find a lot was just initially the way some of these systems were installed was just wrong and nobody came in to truly audit it unless you had a third party commissioner involved who would come in that didn't install it and didn't mount any panels on the equipment and didn't right because they come in like okay now we're supposed to do our job assuming what you just installed was done right mm -hmm. and um often i guess that has become or is a huge issue. And it also leads to the snowball effect where like four years later, you'll have that arena or the stadium who that is brand new. And they're saying, well, well, nothing works. It just doesn't work. And we sometimes overlook like the root cause, or maybe we just don't know, right. To look for that. Yeah. I, I, I don't want to like put brain box on blast or, or, or call a discrepancy here. But what I would like to understand is like, if let's say day one, maybe the systems weren't actually installed properly, is that something that we could understand by using the technology or is this part of an audit that would take place before the solution would be deployed? So we usually, uh, what you just described, we usually discover it when we start to do the extraction, right? So, okay. so we, we start to do the extraction of the data and uh, because we never went to the building. So we were, we're sending the box by, by, by a courier, uh, they install it. If it's a driver, they download it. They install it in the J's. Then we start to extract. Uh, when we when we start the extraction, um, we have a team which is doing the, the data mapping and the data tagging, where we're following the, the the A stack standard, and and so they're doing their job. But but what's interesting is we start to see the quality of the data coming in. So right. it could be uh, you know we start to see these uh, room temperature at one thousand Fahrenheit, and we go really. Um, <laughs> Or you know, a minus five under it, like, uh, or or sometimes there's data, sometimes there's no more data. So these these flicking, you know, value coming in, coming out. Um, so you have visibility, and then you don't have visibility for two hours. Oh, now we have data again. So, so we start to see that, and we call it the quality of the data. So for us, it's it's kind of outlining outlining what we will be able to do. So we go back to the customer and say, here is the list of weird data that we're seeing in your building. So it could be a faulty sensor. It could be a, a valve which is not responding at all. It's, the valve is not modulating. It's a modulating valve, but it always 100%, no matter what's happening outside or inside of the building. So, you know, maybe you should get these things fixed um, because garbage in, garbage out, right? So yeah. if you don't fix them, we will not be able to modulate that floor or that section of the building. Or so just so, so just so you know, so if you don't fix them, we will do what we can with, with the area of the building which are in good shape, but you should fix these things. Um, so, in, and very often the customer is like, really, I was not aware of that. Um, oh, that's what explain why we're having so much complaint. And blah, blah. so it's interesting to see like the, the root cause, right? Um, but you're right. And, and, and it's very often the case. Uh, uh. Yeah, it's it's a very important um, concept because I think what's also really cool is like, at least what I've experienced in that in the HVAC side of this, you know, building technology space is that 
to the original point of how we have certain individuals who really understand these systems holistically, um, it's, it's hard because sometimes you'll have someone come out and do an energy audit, right? And what they're looking at is like the bills and they're trying to see what your spend is. And, you know, they'll give you a report and say, you're spending this much, the average to your area and consumption and usage should be this, and you could save this much. And they're looking at like one piece of the puzzle compared to the whole picture. And I, and I think what's, what the main point I'm trying to get at is like, these audits often that we've been doing for many, many years has been solely based on the human doing that audit and the mm-hmm. human who has the expertise all the way from A to Z to do it in the right way to give good data back to that customer so they actually know what's going on. And mm-hmm. I think what's really, I, you know, I, I know Brainbox's whole you know, mentality is to keep moving forward into the future and create that predictive environment for the individuals. But that is so important. The fact that you guys can also kind of slap on or bolt on, you know, the, the solution to an environment. And, and before you even start going down the predictive path, we can at least give something back to the owner and yeah. say, here's where we're starting. Like, just so you know, Mr. Owner, here's what you have. Right. And that is today is besides your technology, there is really no like easy button for that. And, and then I mean, you're very right. And, and I think uh, that's a mistake that we're doing at Brainbox is like we were <laughs> so excited by, by, you know, playing with the neural network that we like, oh, let's put it in. And we forget that we're kind of bringing additional value uh, way before we play with the neural network, right? So yeah. it's, uh, it's, something we, uh, it's something we have to look more uh, on our side of how to, to explain that to the customer. Because for us, it's more like a frustration, right? Hey, Mister the Customer, you have all these points yeah. that you should fix. So please fix it so we could play with it, right? Um, yeah, like fix it so we could work and do what we exactly. wanted. Exactly. I think that's yeah. you know I'm not going to take any credit for that, but I will say like the market and the opportunity there also in conjunction with what you're doing is so massive. I mean, there's so many. I you know I started a side you know little business b- before I joined my new company where I was going to kind of help some customers do the sanity checks you know on new projects and. And, you know, start with the vision, work backwards, look at the actual plan specification, figure out what was done, what's getting done, where it's going. And it's so interesting because, you know, that key component of helping people understand what they even have is often overlooked. And, you know, there is so much opportunity there, especially with the rate of construction and how much is getting done. And when you start going down the path of retrofit work and people who are about to spend hundreds of millions of dollars retrofitting a space. I mean, I think those of us who sit on the design side know that going into an existing building and fixing it and changing it and updating it is often way more complex than starting from scratch. And, you know, that, you know, I'm not going to say put my name on it, but like definitely something to consider. And especially for the listeners to realize that there's an opportunity here beyond taking the predictive approach, working with Brainbox to do yeah. all the other stuff too. Yeah, I mean, when, when, you know, when you're walking into a building that's got 46,000 points, um, when is the last time somebody looked at each of them one by one to make sure that they were healthy, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> good and question. The, yeah, I mean, it's also one other thing I want to talk, I want to mention or discuss, you know, before we conclude, I'd love if you can help help us understand, you know, like, what, what does the future of Brainbox look like? I mean, I know there's, you don't need to share anything that's proprietary, of course, but we, you know, we'd love to understand kind of like where you're going. Cause we already know you're very innovative and, you know, there aren't many other companies today that exist, like what you guys are doing specifically would love to kind of understand the direction and where you see the industry going. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, imagine now that we're, now we're, we're, we're basically deploying these AI agent, which are uh, modulating their building. Um, so what we're starting to notice now is like you, you take like a, a, any downtown core in North America, we're starting to have a lot of our agent which are modulating different buildings. So each of these agents really, they, they're self-aware that they exist. Uh, they have no clue that there's other tower around them. They actually know no clue that they're in downtown core of anything. Um, but they're operating their building, they're doing their own business, right? So 
we kind of realize that, okay, the next step is really to connect these agents. So all of the agents in the same neighborhood in the same city, let's connect them together so they are aware that there's other agents around them that operating different tower, which are all unique, of course. And then the question is, can we receive from the utility, what are the constraints? What are the problem that they're gonna have in the next few hours? And ask the AI agent if collectively, kind of a swarm kind of effect, can they contribute to resolve the problem of the utility by playing with the thermal battery? So maybe they could pre-charge a chill water or the hot water or whatever to basically not create a common peak together without having any effect whatsoever on the comfort of the people. So we're not talking about here about shutdowning things, but really to operate your thermal load in a different fashion. So you're gonna help the utility to face its constraint that it's coming up. Uh, and we call this the Swarm AI, and we're developing this right now. Uh, it requires an install base, of course, because if you only have two buildings, you're not gonna have a big swarm. But if you have like many building and then hundreds of buildings, then you're gonna have a huge swarm effect. Um, and that is something which is quite interesting if you put it also in the context of what other companies are doing. So, you know, more solar panels, so the local production, battery. Uh, so now you have these battery um, and then you have the car charging. Um, so the question is, when shall you charge your real battery? When should you charge your thermal battery? And when should you discharge these two at the optimal time during the day? So that's really like laying out the groundwork of, of what's coming up and it's coming up much faster than we thought. Uh, we're looking at what's happening right now in Australia where we're deploying a lot of building and they're already into that discussion of, well, I, here's my optimal solar panel gain and here's when I'm going to charge my battery. So you should have your thermal battery uh, charging at this time and then discharging at this time because we have this sponge rate coming from the utility, which is going to be very beneficial for us. So we want to benefit from that sponge rate. And so this is happening today in Australia and, and, it's, and it will be happening uh, in a lot of other areas pretty soon. Wow, that's, that's a whole nother ball game because you start going into this, into the, the web concept of efficiency and how to, you know, kind of not yo-yo, but figure out that exact you know, secret sauce or the recipe for success within that environment, like the city or whatever it is, not just that single environment, which is very interesting, especially when you start thinking about the net zero, you know, efforts that these cities and, and entities, you know, the government and all these big projects that we're seeing now where millions and millions and millions of dollars are going into just to make the ROI in what, 20 years, 10 years, or yeah. 20 years really is like kind of the, the average, but think about how much quicker you can make back the ROI or, or, you know, shorten the yeah. ROI time period by doing something like that. That's kind of insane. If you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly your, your solar array is uh, the payback is much shorter. Yeah. way uh, That's shorter. basically what's happening. Very interesting. Uh, and it's, and it's, and it's the clue, right? It's the clue because, uh, we need to we need to optimize that equation if we want to have any chance to save the planet. I mean, because uh, just throwing yeah. kilowatt or cubic uh, feet of gas at it is not the solution. Um, so it's all about how do you optimize that balance, uh, and it's and it's and it's going to be quite exciting. I, I would say that the next five years will be quite exciting when you look at what's happening, not only on the residential side now, but really on the commercial side now. Uh, where it's really exploding. I mean, just think of uh, in a few years, how many car charging station and hotel will be required to have to accommodate its customer as they're checking in at the end of the day. Yeah, uh, uh, it's, it's already happening. I mean, you drive down the street, you see these like public car charging stations, you see it in Whole Foods parking lot, you see it. I mean, it's, it's truly the way of the future. And I think you know, what's interesting is eventually like a technology like yours, as much as you guys may play in the building space, the AI component in the program and that component of the technology could easily impact other areas too. It, it doesn't only have to come back to that. And there's a lot of possibilities that you can, you know, achieve when you think about it, once you start taking it to the next level. 
it's an ecosystem, right? So it, yeah. you need to you need to play your role in that ecosystem. It, it, it's not a silo. Well, thank you. I, I just want to, you know, maybe end with one more note. If you can kind of help us, you know, understand what maybe the best way would be to connect with Brainbox and you and like what the typical go to market looks like for those listening in that might want to benefit from, you know, Brainbox um, so the listeners can 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 hear that. Yeah, please. Uh, info at brainboxai.com. Uh, uh, we're looking for uh, bright people uh, in AI and building uh, engineering. Uh, uh, we're always looking for new people. Um, it's quite an interesting adventure. Um, we are, we're deploying the technology now in, uh, in not only North America, but in Australia and Asia and uh, even in the Middle East and Europe. Um, so we're, we're, we're wherever it is, we we could ship you a box. I love that. I already have a handful of, or like list, a long list of customers where I'm like, I need to call them and say, Hey, by the way, you know, cause I'm, even though I, you know, kind of focus in security now more, more, uh, laser focused on, on access control, you know, building technology is so near and dear close to my heart. I love it. It's, 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 it's oddly cool. I mean, it, I feel like it doesn't get enough attention and, um, I, I, you know, I, I do have some plans to start, start sending your guy's name out now. Um, especially now that we did this episode, I think it's, I think people are going to love it. So. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much, Sarah. It was a pleasure. Thank you. We'll see you soon.